Yes, and also I don't like why you have these things coming at the bottom. Amit, yeah. Just a second, just a second. Okay, good. I think it's out. What can I do? What should we do? I think it has not. Okay. Yes. Friends, uh, we are very happy to have an artist in our midst. Uh, so welcome to today's Asset Colloquium. Uh, Asset stands for Advances in Science, Engineering and Technology. This is a long running colloquium series of our institute uh, and it hosts uh, speakers from a diverse set of areas. Uh, so our speaker today is uh, Moshmi Bhomik. Uh, she is a singer, writer, researcher, and archivist. She is based in Kolkata, but travels between India, Bangladesh, and the UK. She maintains the Traveling Archive, a web-based resource containing recordings of music of diverse origins. Uh, this Traveling Archive will be the topic of the talk today. Moshmi studied in Shillong, Agartala, Shantiniketan, and Jadapur University. She recently submitted her PhD thesis at uh, Jadapur University, and the thesis was based on the wax recordings of Arnold Bakke. Moshmi's uh, achievements and renown uh, as a musician are well known to many in this audience. I will just mention that she composed music for the film Matir Moina, which won the Critics Prize at Khan in 2002 and the Best Music Prize at the Kara Film Festival in Karachi in 2003. Uh, you must have seen posters for several events as you walked into the Institute over the past week. They are all connected to Moshmi's visit, which we have been planning for almost uh, six months. Uh, Bhashwati and I have been discussing this with several of our colleagues. And 
we initially intended it to coincide with 50 years of the Bangladesh War of Independence. And then we thought it would probably happen together with uh, the International Mother Language Day. But we have had to wait until now for it to really happen. But it's happening. Uh, all that is not important. Uh, the important thing is this. Uh, so friends, this is Moshmi Pami. <laughs> and Moshmi, these are my friends. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> So friends, um, <clears throat> my friend Tariq Masood, uh, the filmmaker in Bangladesh, who died tragically in 2011, he was more than a friend to me. He was a mentor. He was, well, after he died, his wife wrote to me that I've lost a partner and you've lost a parent. So it was as close as that and as deep as that. So Tarek and I, we had a conversation. That was the last conversation that we had for the television uh, Desh TV in Dhaka, uh, a few months before uh, Tarek's accident. And uh, it was actually brought, uh, it was telecast after he was gone. That's not the point here. The point here is that Tarek and I, we were discussing before the, uh, we were go going to go to the studio. He said, so what should we talk about? As it is, they were telling me, um, who would you be comfortable talking to or talking with? And I didn't know many people. So I finally said, OK, maybe Tarek. So then Tarek and I, we got talking, and uh, we were discussing what to say. and then. Tarek would always say, you're so snooty, you know, he'd always say, um, you, you, uh, you, you know, you, you really need to come down a bit. And then, so I, he would always say this. So, um, and so then I said, we should bring up this point about me being snooty, you know, and you should actually, we should address this question. And then, uh, so Tarek asked me, so it was kind of a little bit of a, what we call in Bangla got up, you know, so we had rehearsed this, but we didn't know how we would ad address, actually deal with the question. So he said, why is it that you don't go and perform everywhere? Why don't you, why, you, why are you so selective? So I said, uh, well, I am like that and I don't deny it. And then we got talking, he said, I understand. He said, so there are, there is this thing in Bangla Gan, Lok Gan, in Bengali folk music. So we have the bowls, and the bowls um, engage in what is called Shadhu Shango. So Shadhu Shango, in Shadhu Shango, you, you talk in a language which is understood within the community. It's not understood by everybody. It's very, it's full of codes. And not everyone will understand this language, but there is also there are other meanings to draw from that from those songs. So you can have one kind of a meaning that you draw from the song, depending on at what level uh, the the um, uh, the relationship, the the degree of intimacy that the listener has with the song. So sometimes you can. Um, uh, there are many ways of understanding these songs. But, but within the community, within that closed community, they would understand the song for its codes, which outside the community people would not understand. And then Tarek said that Shadhu Shanga is very important, actually. So uh, the fact that you also like to communicate with a certain kind of people and you actually uh, draw inspiration and you, you uh, f by, by communicating with, within your community, whatever that community might be, uh, that makes perfect sense. So he was actually endorsing the way I am in the end. You know, he was not saying that he was, he was being very understanding and he said, I understand why you're like this. 
So I take this moment as a moment of Shadhu Shango today. So I'm talking with friends and I am, I know that we will understand each other's codes. It is a privilege to be here. It's a privilege to be talking with people who understand your codes. I'm, I'm kind of hoping, you know, because, uh, because it's difficult. It's understood within, especially for musicians, for artists, it's understood that, especially with singers, there's this given, you know, that you are there to sort of please people. You're the entertainer of the evening. And uh, therefore, something will necessarily communicate. It doesn't. All music is not for everybody. And we should not assume that all music will be understood by everybody. We should not even think like that. We understand language is also very limited. And language is not the, this whole thing of universality of music. It's, it doesn't really work. I mean, then the uh, people's song should be Bollywood. You know, Bollywood is, the, is, is actually what we should call people's music. But we, uh, we call people's music, we give that name to other kinds of songs as well. Songs of protest we call people's music. So who are these people? That's another limited group. So people are of different kinds. So here in this community of shadhus, uh, the way I would like to go about this talk is this. I've been moving with and for the song for a very long time. Moving with the song, I think, from the time I was a child. Because the song moved inside me somehow, you know, when I was very small. And my parents saw that, that there was a churning inside me. There was a song that was moving inside me. They listened to me and they let, they, they were the ones, the first ones, who let the song come out. So, and since then, the song has been moving within me. Songs of many kinds have been in many places. And I have listened to many kinds of songs. And I've not been bound to a, one kind of song either. I went to an English medium school in Shillong. We would sing hymns when we went, to, went into, uh, into our assembly hall. Uh, end of the year programs, we would sing Andrew Lloyd Webber. And then, uh, and those, you uh, saw so, uh, things like, you know, uh, Joseph and the Multicolored Coat. And then uh, at home, I would learn Rabindranath Ergan and Dijendra Giti and Otul Prashadi and uh, all sorts of Bengali art song. From my teachers, I'd learn a little bit of Indian classical. And then from records, I'd listen to Jagjit Singh, and I'd listen to Noor Jahan, and I'd listen to all sorts of things, you know. And we'd listen to also to John Baez and to the Beatles and to Leonard Cohen and Bob Dylan. So a lot of things. And I was never, um, I let whatever come to me, I, I just let it come to me. I, I, I was not, I, my ears were receptive and when I could, when I connected with the kind of song I just did and, and some of it has stayed with me, things that I heard as a child have stayed with me and have formed me. So with moving with the song and letting the song move within you, what happens is that you, you're slowly being trained, like all of you have been trained sort of honed in a particular way, you start learning that, okay, this is my direction, this is where I'm going. So I was, I was kind of, I knew from the start that this is where I'm going, I'm going to be a singer. This, at least my parents knew it, you know, that she's going to be a singer. My sister would be a scientist and I'd be a singer. So um, that was kind of understood. But um, what kind of singer would I be? That's the question. So the songs moving inside me and me moving slowly through time. When I come to my teens and then I become this, as te teenagers are, I'm, I'm a rebel. So I don't want to sing anymore. 
So I'm a national scholar and I stopped singing. And I decided that I'm not going to go for my classes. I'm not going to take all these lessons. And this is all very elitist. And I'm not going to do it. I'm a people's person. So I'm not going to sing all these songs. So that there goes two, three years past like that. Then I find, start finding my songs slowly. And this is where I'm moving for the song, the, the whole journey of moving for the song begins. Because I'm not happy with the song that is moving inside me. But now I need to move for the song. I recognize these processes now after looking back. It's not like it was a conscious thing. But when I look back now, 30 years on, 35 years on, I can see the beginnings there. So the beginnings were in that rebellion. The beginnings were in that decision not to go to Adhir Babu's class, you know. So that the, the beginnings were there because the beginnings were also in the fact that I was not rejecting songs or the songs would not reject me either. We had a, like a, uh, we were married for, for life. So, uh, so it, that, that nothing would happen to that. And I've realized that over the years, I've realized it. But um, the relationship, the nature of the relationship would change. So the moving for the song began slowly over the years. By the mid 20s, I was writing my songs. And by the early 30s, I was not happy singing on, on stage in this, or either in the streets or just for myself. I was not happy doing music just for myself or within my community. It was not enough. I didn't want to listen to just myself. So I needed to move for other kinds of songs. I needed to find those songs with which I, my, my songs could be connected. I needed a larger, wider world for it. And that is what the traveling archive is all about. The traveling archive happened when I, it started, the germination started. Actually, again, we go back to Tarek because my relationship with Bangladesh started in 1995. I went to, I, I didn't go because my parents came from there or anything, you know, it's, it was not like that at all. I didn't go to find my ancestral home or my roots. I went because I had friends all my age. You know, all very young, in their 20s, we were all in our 20s. All of us would, be, would become whatever we have become over the next 30 years. So Tarek was beginning. Shaheen Akhtar was beginning. Shamim Akhtar was beginning. Dhalial Mamul was beginning. Jolly, Jolly uh, Dilara Begum Jolly were beginning. We were all beginning. I, was, I became part of that community. And so we were all beginning in the 20s, some a little older than me, some a little younger, but we were all beginning. So my life is really bound to the life of Bangladesh that way, because I became part of that group of artists and intellectuals who sort of in the la over the last 30 years, so from the time Bangladesh was 20 to the time Bangladesh became 50, we've all grown up. So we've kind of grown up with Bangladesh, you know, all of us in our kind of 50s in the range, that kind of range. We are as old as Bangladesh, almost, you know, we can say like that. And Bangladesh, when I, when I, 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 when I started to go to Bangladesh, the first time I went in 1995, my first album had already come out. So um, it was called and we'll actually go to that album. We'll be talking about it uh, day after tomorrow. We'll, we, I'll sing a song from that album. I, I won't talk about it more about it now. But there were songs in it. There was an, a, a very interesting beginning in that, in that album. So I was singing actually a song which, in which I quoted Ekushe February, the song of Ekushe February, Amar Bhaiye Rokte Rangano Ekushe February, the song of the language movement. But I hadn't been to Bangladesh yet. So how come I was doing it, you know? So something else, some things that you can never explain. I was in Calcutta. I was growing up, spending my time at Jadupur with my friends, 
you know, in street corner meetings, at feminist meetings, in human rights meetings, and singing all kinds of songs. But how come I sang the song? I wrote this song into my own song, new song, and a fresh writer of songs. I wrote this line in my song, which in which I was quoting uh, the song. Uh, Again, it starts from friendships because I was making friends. Friends who were from Bangladesh who were coming and staying in Calcutta. I was looking at them. I was telling their story in my song. So that relationship started then, when, when I was in my mid-twenties. It started then, and then when I went to, by 1995, when I was in, in uh, Dhaka, Tarek had just come back from uh, New York, and he was about to finish Muktir Gan, the film that you're going to see tomorrow. So the, this is a, a, a extraordinary film, and I'm, you can you will know about it tomorrow. But Tarek and Catherine, they've been working on this film uh, for over the last uh, past few years, and so Tarek was in in um, in in uh, Dhaka. So he looked at me and he had already heard my songs and he said, I was going to go uh, to Chittagong the next day. He said, um, where are you going to go? You're not going anywhere. You're going to stay here now and you're going to sing in a concert. And he said, you're going to sing in a concert in which Shantoshda is also going to sing. Now, who is Shantoshda? So Shantoshda, Shantosh Sharkar comes from Furitpur, a village in near Tarek's home. And he's going to sing some songs of Bijay Sharkar. So Bijay Sharkar was this folk poet whose songs later I came to know. But one of the songs that, Bija, that Shantosh Das sang that day was Mon um, Amar Passport Hoilona. So I couldn't have a passport. Oh heart, I don't have a passport. Now this thing, the metaphor of the passport, where do we want to go? Which border do we want to cross is another question. That, but I, and I sang a song in which Shantajda heard before the concert. And in, this was a song which was, about, which was called Shankha Loghu. And in that song, it went like this. Ekhane tumi shankha logho, okhane tumi jam jamat. Ekhane, so here you're the minority, and there you fill the whole space. Ekhane tumi bosti bashi, okhane chosho rasta ghat. Ekhane tumi bhoye pecho. So you're frightened here. Ekhane tumi ni shahai. Ekhane tumi nam harano. Okhane china komularai. Kothai jano manu. Kande, Kothai Jano Kache Hai Manush Bodo Bhai Pete Manush Bodo Nisha Hai O Kane to me Shanka Logu. So Ekane and Okane change place. So here and there this side and that side, they just change position and the name slightly changes. So Kamul Rai becomes Kamal Bhai. And that's where our vulnerabilities in one, on one side we're vulnerable, on the other side we dominate. That is what the song was. When I sang this song, um, Shantajda said, God, that's my song that you're singing, you know. So actually this moving for the song started then. And this was again, it was facilitated by my friends within that Shadhu Shango that I could actually begin this journey. Over the years then, 
I began to know this place in a deeper way, in a different kind of way. My first years in Bangladesh used to be very Dhaka-centered. So I'd meet the same kinds of people. But even within that, I would foray into, uh, into um, neighborhoods where most of my middle class friends never went. So this is Patua Tuli as a place where I would go. Patua Tuli is a place where they have this local cassette industry. And there they have these cassettes which were wrapped in cellophane. And there they would sell those cassettes. And I would buy lots of them and bring them back home. I have them stacked at home. And those cassettes, um, they had certain kinds of songs which really, really um, caught, caught my you know, imagination. So they were bichedgan, some of them were songs of separation. And they had these amazing voices of women such as Mamtas, Aleha, Saleha, women, extraordinary women. So they sang songs like, um, Dekhe jai, dekhe jai go. And then the dhol would start and amazing songs, you know, brilliant songs. So, and these women. So I used to work for a women's studies, uh, a gender studies publisher. And then in 1998, we went to London. And I was very upset. I was very sad to leave uh, my job, my home, and my place and go there. So I felt the song inside me, it was kind of dying, or it, it had died. So at that time, I started to think about writing a proposal, a project proposal, on these women singers with these extraordinary voices. And I wanted to write about their story. I wanted to write research into their lives and find out how do they deal with this whole thing of living between the stage and the home? How do they negotiate the two? And that is where I started this whole thing of traveling into the field. So that is the background for the traveling archive. So um, around uh, 20, and, and uh, nine, two, around 2000, 2001, I started to think about actually working on songs of love, loss, and loneliness in the folk music of Bengal. That is where I started to think uh, my ideas began to form themselves. Went to, I got a little grant from IFA, uh, the India Foundation for the Arts in Bangalore. I, st I had a recorder. I started to move. I started to travel. I started to travel also with friends. And the, and the main person I traveled with for the next 10 years was Shukanta Mojumdar, with whom I uh, created the traveling archive. He, he's a, he was, he's a sound recordist. And till two years ago, we worked together very closely. And, um, and I also worked with cinematographers and I worked with various people. Also, I did a lot of recording on my own. But by, by the end of two years, I was already, I was, I kind of, uh, the collection that we had traveling across, uh, I mean, beyond Dhaka, beyond Calcutta, beyond Shantiniketan, to so many places and such extraordinary voices. That, and the recordings were so good. Actually, the recordings were very good. They were not, they were, because the, here was a film, a film sound person who was actually doing the recordings. And I was doing the research. So the, the combination of the two just made the recordings, the quality of the recordings very, very good. And then we thought, what do we do with these recordings now? And are we going to just hand them over to an archive? Or are we going to start building something of our own? Are we going to travel? Because in a lot of places, people would tell you, because they're used to a kind of researcher. And they did, they, so they're in Maman Singh in a place, uh, someone called Robin Bhai said, 
Oh, you come, you take our songs, you go away, you never come back. You know, so, but that was not what at least I intended to do. Because in a lot of these places, it's been more or less of a horizontal spread and more of a vertical plunge that I've made. So I have gone to the same place again and again and again and again, you know, and recorded over eight years, the same person, often the same song. So you see the song changing slightly, the place changing, the person aging, the song, the meaning of the song changes to you, those kinds of things also we did. So by um, 2007, I was thinking of um, the research project becomes one about not just uh, research documentation, but it also becomes about dissemination. So then we go back to the field with the songs and we start playing the songs to the people in the field. We don't play only their songs, but we also play other songs to them because uh, we want to share with them our experience of the song. So say in, when I listen to a song in Purulia and I think of somebody in um, Kachar, then when I go back to Kachar, I play the song to Jadup Sharkar in Kachar and I say, you know what, I was thinking about you. And then we see how he responds and then we record that response. So already we were recording sound over sound. We were already that layering of sound over sound, sound upon sound was beginning, listening upon listening. So you record the listening of another person. So the work was getting more and more complex. So what began as my personal thing began to become far more complex. A very elaborate map was sort of opening up before my eyes. And then I was also going to the archives. While we were building our own archive, I was also going to the archives to listen to songs be recorded before me or in the same field. So the thesis that I wrote is on the wax cylinders of a Dutch scholar called Arnold Barker, who came to India in 1925 for the first time to Shantini Ketan. Then he came back with the phonograph in 1931 and between 31 and 34, he made a lot of recordings in Bengal. So uh, with Barker, I say that I did not meet Barker in the archive, but I met him in the field. He was there 80 years or 85 years before me, but we met in the same field. So, and then with all those recordings, the kind of work that I've done in my, which also took eight years to do, and I, I took the recordings of Arnold Barker back to the field, went looking for the people, went looking for the place, went looking for the songs. And sometimes I found certain things, sometimes I did not find anything. And I recorded both the absence of the song and the presence of the song and the change in the song. And that became um, the work that I did around Arnold Barker. And with the recordings, with those recordings, you also begin to listen to sound in a different way. Because these are different, the sound, the recordings are, have a different quality to them. So they, there is that surface noise. So in the beginning, you cannot listen. So you learn to listen, you play once. You cannot listen to anything because it sounds like noise. And then you listen again and you listen again. And over, over and over and over, as you listen, you begin to find the song. The song is, it's like an archaeology of sound that you do. You dig into the sound. And as you dig into it, you slowly begin to actually listen to the song. And you hear fragments of sound. You hear bits of sound. You hear bits of words, lost words. So it's almost like rivers that have lost their trail. You know, so you see a bit of the stream a bit of the water, and then some of it is lost. Again, you find something. So that's been the kind of work that I've been engaged in. So, and the surface noise, as my friend, um, um, as my friend Robert Millis says, that, you know, with all these old songs, what is it? You know, what, what are these recordings? Suddenly, now there was an object that captured the song. Was it the actual song that it captured? The singer, a hunk of shellac or, and dirt, 
a fetishistic object. Today, beneath the sediment, there is a partial but incredible archaeology of sound and imagery. So that is what old recordings are. And what that's what these old records are. It's an incredible archaeology of sound and imagery. And I'm basically still very much at the surface of things. It'll take me another lifetime to go anywhere deep. So, okay, so here I'll, I just, um, these are some images. I also worked with a lot of images from the archives because these are images of the sound of the musicians and of the places where Arnold Barker went and he made his recordings. So these are, this is an, a very interesting um, um, excavation that I have been engaged in. So these are the Fakirs whom Arnold Barker recorded in 1932 in Noga. It's a place um, in now in Rajshahi district in the northwest of Bangladesh. And Noga, the, it, of course, that was then it was undivided Bengal. And um, so um, he went, he made these recordings in two, two, 2015. And all I had was these scratchy sounds and I had archival notes and Arnold Barker actually left very few notes. So he just very cryptic notes. So to decipher that and to get to the place from where the recording was made, it's very difficult often. So Barker um, left these notes, names for, for these fakirs. There's all these a list of about 12 singers and uh, 15 tracks and um, there's no place name that's given or at least I did not see any place name. So they were recorded in the district uh, in the subdivisional officer who was Onnuda Shankar Rai was the subdivisional officer at that time. So he was a famous um, writer. He was the, the ICS officer in Rajshahi at that time and his wife, American wife. So Barker and his wife, they went and stayed in on the, on the Shankar's house and they made these recordings. The only thing that was written there was Ganja Workman. So first I didn't even notice, I didn't understand the significance of this thing, Ganja Workman. What can that mean? You know, there are these songs, there's this one thing, Ganja Workman, nothing else that's written. So Basiruddin Fakir and Masiruddin Fakir and Jora Khatun KP, all these things are written, all these names are written. Mukundu Fakir. But, and then for some Azimuddin, bracketed Ganja Workman. So in 2015, I went to Naga. And in Naga, I went with these photographs and with these names. And there was actually the Ganja Society, uh, Co Ganja Cooperative Society of Noga. So Ganja used to be grown there. It, it was legal to grow uh, Ganja. And that was the main thing, uh, uh, one of the main agricultural uh, crops that was grown. And it was largely part of the, it's, it sustained the economy in a very big way. So what I learned was, when the ganja, uh, the, the seeds ripened at the time of the harvest, the fakirs came. Like you have tea, tea testers or tasters, testers, um, like you have ganja tasters or testers. And who would be the best taster or tester? The fakirs, of course, you know, because they know the real rush of these things here. So, so they would come and when they came in February, there would be music. So there would be, that is what another song collector of Bengal, Mansuruddin had told Arnold Barker. Mansuruddin is a very famous song collector who brought out 13 volumes of um, uh, folk songs called uh, under the title of Haramoni, Lost Jewels. And Mansuruddin 
uh, and Arnold Bach and Onoda Shankar Rai helped Bach make these recordings. So there, this is my first trip. I go to this place. There's this Ganja Society office. They don't have, all the plantation has now become either, it's become fisheries or it's become markets. It's become supermarkets. It's become houses that they've put on rent. And uh, so that is, that's what it's become. And he said, the people, they sat there sadly and they looked very, very distressed, you know, just to think the music is gone. You know, the rush has gone from their lives, you know. And so they said, um, you know, when there used to be this music, the parrots used to come. When we had this fruit, the parrots used to come. So I had this image of the fakirs being parrots, you know, and the parrots that had flown away. So the parrots had flown away. And uh, so, um, and I can't find them. So over the next five years, I continued to go to this place. Summer, and I continued to listen to those songs. I kept going back to the archive and somehow, somewhere, I, I'm sure it happens to you all as well in your research, that something that's there right in front of your eyes, you don't notice till you know, you've made five trips. And suddenly I found that in that archival note, there's a place name that's given. And I hadn't seen this for at least the first three years, I hadn't noticed this. And it, there was only one place name given for all the 14 tracks. So naturally, I, it, I missed it. Then, but this place name was strange because it was, um, it was Diljan Fokir, who was from, um, Kunijgram, that's village Kunij, in Dorilpur or Shoilogachi in Noga. Now, what do you make of such a note? You know, what is the name of this place then? What name? Like it has four names. How do you deal with that? And then I had friends in the folklore department of Rajshahi University, and he looked at the note and he said, Look, none of these names are right. So now this is the question of listening. So Barker is writing what he's listening. They are saying this in their own local dialect, in their own accent. Barker is writing that down phonetically. So he's making mistakes. So he's written Shorgachi for a place that's called Shoilogachi. It again takes me two years to realize this, you know, and then finally I reach Shoilogachi. That's a long story. Reach Shoilogachi and reach Kunij Gram. I reach Kunij, I reach Kunu, it's not Kunij, it's Kunuj. I reach, in the fifth year, I reach Kunuj Gram. And then I reach, it's not Dorilpur, it's Doriapur. And then they say Doriapur is actually, who might have the, the, the errors get, uh, accum you accumulate errors because uh, somebody is typing from the handwritten, Barker's handwriting was absolutely dreadful, you know. So, so um, uh, someone, somewhere, you know, compounded errors. So then you get, um, then finally when we reached Doriapur, so, one of the men, now, okay, so there, this was the other woman. Uh, this was the only woman in that group, okay. And all of the others were women, uh, men. So the question that kept, I kept asking myself, who was Jora Khatun? You know, that is the question that was driving me for these five years. I kept asking myself, who was Jora Khatun? How do I find her? Who is this woman who sang in, with all these other men? Who is this woman who actually, even Anuda Shankar writes about in his memoirs? She was, she was the best they all wrote. And yet, how do I find her? So I kept asking this question and I went on this search. So Kunuj Gram, when I went to Doriap, Doriapur, I found, one of the grand, I found the grandson of one of the singers who was recorded by Anil Baka and of Mukundu Phokir, and he said, firstly, he looked at the photographs and he said, I haven't seen my grandfather. Then he looked very closely and he said, well, this must be my grandfather, because 
he looked exactly like him. So I thought that, well, he hasn't seen his grandfather, but he's seen himself in the mirror. So uh, that's how, um, and then, uh, so then I realized that there's only one place named for this entire village because all the fakirs went from this village. This was a village of fakirs, actually. And they said to me, this is the Pokire Doria. So Doria is river. So this is the river of the fakirs. This is a river of music, which is why this is the name that we give to this place. And everybody went from this place, the ones who sang. And so, and a few were the ganja, pe the people who worked in the uh, plantation. But who was this woman, I asked, and nobody knew who she was. So this could be also part of our discussion yesterday, that finally, Jora Khatun, I could not find her. So she is the parrot that who has flown away. The rest have come home. She's the parrot who, who has flown away. So, but you have to, where's the song, but I have this. It is there, right? Yeah. Cool. On the picture. On the picture. I can't see it. Oh, yeah, yeah, I can see it. So, how, how is it going to play from my speaker? No, it's, it's going to be a problem. So, because we didn't, sorry, it won't work. Anyway, I think, oh, My mic. No, this is sacrilege. Okay. 
क्या हुआ क्या हुआ कर दिया नाउ इट्स नाउ व्हाट इट्स ऑफ द माइक ना व्हाट्स एपनिंग इसको छोड़िए इसको नहीं चाहिए हमको और आई प्ले इट लेटर बिकॉज आई वील वी कैन डू दैट लेटर बट आई थिंक आई जस्ट वॉन्ट टू फिनिश क्विकली ना that um so this is the traveling archive this is the website and you i, re I really urge you all to look at it and um go into it and you can listen to all these things there so this is how we begin the journey and so we have all of these we have the recording sessions in which you can you we'll see uh, it's not absolutely up updated but I, i think i have till 2019 uh but it's it's only a fragment of what we have we've done it's it's really it's nothing compared to the amount of material that there is and uh, i don't know how i'm going to f do so much work uh but this is the new thing that i want to show you this is my the research that i've done the this is exclusively on my uh, thesis so it kind of mirrors the thesis and it has these multiple chapters so um, just as my thesis has so it has nine chapters and each opens up to several sub chapters and then you so it is like you open a door you go to the next room and then that has to it has it you have a room to enter and you have a room to leave so imagine it like that this website is a bit like that or if you were walking over the ocean then you walk from one point to another it's endless so it's really a bit like an endless thing that is possible to do and i'm not saying what i have done is endless i'm saying the possibilities are endless and the uh, the possibilities are endless and uh, it's not I, it's not for me to do it either so you others will do it when i can't and uh, but there are these possibilities because it we are talking about um as you say the the archive is the um, it's it's the future of the past right so it is how we keep the how we how we think we are going to remember the past that's why uh, that's what an archive is how do we remember how do we want the past to be remembered so then archive is also very selective it is um so how do we want the past to be remembered and how do we want the past to be excavated and which bits of the past do we want to remember and which bits of the past do we not want to remember all of those things are there so the whole question of the archive is not an objective place it's very much a political and a subjective place that's what my understanding of an archive is so what i have done is very much my own personal thing i chose to keep certain things i chose to explore certain things even official and so called established and you know um yeah establishments which are archives such as the british library such as the archives and research center for ethnomusicology such as the smithsonian none of these are objective places we must remember because history is never objective the writing of history is never objective it is subjective it is political it's a political thing that we do when we tell our story so such is my story too i want to show you one thing which is about the past and the future and the present all held together in this one thing 
Um, these are the, these. Okay, so these are some films that I found when I went to a place called Moina Dal in Birbhum. And um, they gave some old films that they had. So here, Arnold Barker had been in 1933. We went into 2014. In between, in 1994, they had started to record their songs. So they started, they got a videographer to come and make these, you know, VHS recordings. And they gave me all those recordings. So here, if we go to this one, I don't know if this, I, you will possibly not hear the sound here. Doesn't matter. I want you to see somebody here. See this person that you're seeing. This dancer, very elegant, in that this is a community that dances and sings the kirtan, which is a form of devotional song. So, and this is a family that does it. It's been doing that for 500 years. So we went and only the men sing here. The women are not allowed to sing. So Nitai, this person is called Nitai. He was singing and dancing. In this clip, you see him. When we met him in 20, 2014, I, um, he was dancing. He's older now. So this is from 1994. So he is 20 years older and um, so heavier, but more experienced. And he's dancing. On that, they do this during the birth of Krishna. So during John Mashtumi, they have the celebration. So Nitai was there, he was one of the main people we met and recorded. And he's there in our, uh, on the website. But Nitai was, uh, uh, was also one of the main persons, very young at that point in 1994. And he had taken a lead in sort of documenting the family's tradition. So he was going from person to person with a mic and saying, so can you say something about you know, our tradition and what this music is all about? And this is a family of mus musicians. Everybody is a singer, coal player, dancer. So then Nitai, this, and then in 2014, we recorded him. In 2015, I call Nitai to ask about something. I call his number. There is, I hear a certain sounds, and then um, I, I, and he's, he earlier when I've called him, he he he's very wonderful. He responds with so much warmth. But this time there was no almost no answer. Then I called him again, and then I said, "Is this Nitai?" And he said, "Then is this Nitai?" And then this person, I said, "Is this Nitai's phone?" And they said, "Yes." Then I said, "Is can I talk to Nitai?" And then the person on the other side said, "Nitai has died." And he was all of fifty-one, maybe has died. And we are now in the crematorium, we've come to for his last thing, you know, they said. And so the sounds that I was hearing were actually the sounds of the wind and the fire. He was on the pyre at that time. So then how do we listen to Nitai now? So when I look at these images, I, I, I've said this before, and I, I keep thinking about this, that, you know, this image of Nitai that you see here, and you see his future, when you look at it now, when you know the story of what happened to Nitai, then you no longer see him in his youth, but you see him on the pyre. You no longer listen to the song, but you listen to the sound of the fire and the wind. So that is what happens when you look at it. And what we have archived in this image is not just Nitai's past but his future too and that is what the traveling archive has tried to do i've been trying to do and i'm going to end with something that I, jay kumar had asked me to do because today is earth day and this this my work is so much also about this great land of which we are a part you know, and so much that's been changing. 
And the songs that I've been recording for the last 20 years, the death of the song is happening not just because of, you know, people forgetting the songs, but because lives are changing, lifestyles are changing, people are having to leave lands. And it's not just because of they, they want some to go somewhere better that they're leaving the land. Someone from Shundarban leaves the land because of Ayla. You see, and goes to Gurga and says that I was, I don't find any trees here. So I stand in the shade of these tall buildings. And this man who was, who used to row boats and catch fishes in Shundarban is completely lost and he's lost his songs in the meantime. So that's what happens to the songs as well, you see. And I think it's, it's time we thought about these things. I mean, of course, everybody, we are all thinking about these things. I don't know what we can do, but <clears throat> I have worked across the borders and there, there's this whole thing of the perspectives from the hill up on in Meghala, where I grew up. You look down into the waters of Silet in Bangladesh, and there are the floating boats with little lights. And my friend, my Kasi friend, my, my Mizo friend, Rini says, you know what? I've seen those floating lights down below. I have seen both the floating light and the hill up there because I've been to both places. So I know what that floating light means. And that floating light also means the time of monsoons, the time when the agricultural land fills up with water, the time of great music, the time of Monusha Puja, the time of the Puja for the snake goddess. And that's the time of songs. Now, earlier there used to be eight months of water and four months of dry land. Now there's six, five months of water. So we're getting lesser water. We will get lesser songs as a result as well, you know. So the songs, you can preserve them, you can keep in an archive, but the song will not have its life anymore. So I just end with a song. Uh, Pirachur joy, Prithibi ke dhure thake. So, this massive sun that holds the, the earth. Nakhatra prohorat, alok hela shara bela. Matite bijer bash. Matite norom ghash, gacher patara yashe jaye, haye yashe jaye, birat shur joye, prithi bike dhore thake. Ekla, 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 so you walked alone for long and then some someone comes to you and says i'm walking the same way let's walk together come Cholo khanik ta pot, tabe, ek shathe chola hobe, birat shur joye, prithi bike dhore thake. So this is how days come and this is how nights come. He bhabe din chole, Hey, bhabe raat chale. Ekhono emni kore prithi bir. Pot dhore, pot chale. Chale thame, chale manusher dal. And the song of fullness will never end. 
of this room have heard such sound before. Uh, <coughs> anyway, uh, are there any questions? Sorry? No, it's just on this one website and uh, the Travelling Archive, which is my website. But I think over the years we have to share it with other websites as well, and that's the that's the idea that I have. Yeah. 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 I I will. Thank you so much, Suresh. Thank you for coming. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's that's my plan now because a lot of work has been done now. Now it's also I'm also at that point in my life when I need to start packing things, and so and then also start putting things in order. And you know, and I want to. I think there are three places where I feel the work should certainly be kept. One is in, in um, Bangladesh, of course. One is in Bengal, in uh, West Bengal. And uh, uh, the other is in London. Because these are the three places where I have worked and worked uh, uh, in such close association with, and not with the British Library or something, because uh, in somewhere more accessible, more local, where local people will add to it, you know, something like that. So I want to think about these things now. Yeah. So, uh, you know, in your archaeology of sound, that you, um, so I, I can see how difficult it is because mm -hmm. from whatever sample you could hear. So, <clears throat> I mean, I was just wondering whether um, some uh, use of technology might also help here. In particular, uh, you know, in Jaikuma school, there's been some uh, very interesting work on speech recognition and uh, uh, things like that. Yeah. So getting, you know, speech signals from uh, noise and so on uh, may also be helped with a little bit of uh, that kind of technology. Absolutely. Maybe. I think, and I have, uh, there is someone called Obimonnu Deb. He is a sound recordist and uh, uh, he worked with, for HMV and now he works independently. He used to also teach at the uh, uh, Shotojit Rai Film and Television Institute. And uh, Obimonnu Deb is very, is a master at sort of restoration of sounds. And a lot of this, especially the wax cylinders, they, they, they're so hard to hear. And you can almost, you know the song, but you can't get it, you know, and it's so painful at that point. So uh, he helped to enhance some of the sounds and uh, to bring up the, to clear some of the noise. But then he said something, this is something I was meaning to also to tell you all. So he said something about, um, you know, sometimes it's very hard to understand a particular word. So you can hear a line and then there's a word that's missing. So, or you, you, you just repeated listening and you can't understand whether it is um, uh, dhal or tall. Okay, let's say. 
So Hall or Toll, I'm just giving an example random. So then he says that, um, or um, uh, Bod or, or Rob, you know, that kind of a thing. Then he said, look, this is the problem is not necessarily with the disappearance of sound. The problem is with such as if you do not, if, like you must remember to strike all your T's and you know, th that's what you say. Yeah. So yeah, uh, so um, sometimes in sound recording that happens that you have not struck the T. You see, you've not struck the T and therefore this T has become L. And in sound recording that happens. So however much restoration you do, sometimes the sound, the, the word is lost. Those kinds of things also happen, he was telling me. So yeah, and I'm so technologically challenged. And this is also such a woman's thing to say. And it's such a shame. I, I wish I wasn't like this. And my feminist sound recordist friends have said, you have to learn now, you know, but, but how much can you learn? So uh, I, I'm not good at it, but I need to work with others. And I also believe an archive or any research is not a solo thing. It's not a solo journey. It's a collective. And uh, we have to do it together. And um, so I think that's how we'll get the best out of You must have shown during your presentation about different kinds of substance that you've captured during your travel. But I'm curious to know exactly the uh, you know the information that you captured during your travel to UK. Okay. Yeah. So um, I've done several projects in the UK. I've lived in the UK, and I have a kind of a base there. So. Um, uh, there's a set of recordings which are kept at the British Library under the heading of uh, Migration, Memory and Music. So I recorded, um, I recorded uh, sort of immigrants and uh, especially, you know, in East London and uh, their memory of home and the songs that they make home with. So from the left land to the new land. So the journeys uh, that people make and the, uh, so you carry your songs with you, even if you don't carry anything else, you carry your songs in your body, you move with the song. So um, I, I, that was the first set of recordings that we, we did. Some of them are on the website and some of them are uh, with the British Library. The second set of recordings that we did uh, was more elaborate because this time, uh, in 2015, we had uh, an exhibition in London, which was called the Travelling Archive in East London. And there I was thinking about Bengal being this fragmented and this very uh, complex place. It's not just about, you know, because earlier we, it was mostly um, people of Silet, whom I had recorded mainly, or people of Bangladesh. This time I wanted to actually record more of, because Bengal is so scattered, so diverse, and also so unconnected, the parts are so unconnected with one another. People, so uh, what happens is uh, people who live in Shepherd's Bush, the, the doctors um, do not need to interact with the people who live in my land in East London and they don't need to know one another. And they can spend whole lifetimes like that. So um, my idea was to also record here in India, this idea of the Bengal that I carry with me to London. So we divide our land between Nodzul and Rabindranath, which is such a shame. We say, yours, Nodzul is yours and Rabindranath is mine. So we make these kinds of separations, we make these kinds of, you know, bhag batwara, we, we do that. So we divide our treasures. Huh? Sorry? I haven't heard that you know the 
Well, yeah, it is. It is, you see, because it, it's on the basis of... Yeah, huh. Yeah. Yeah. I had many Bangladeshi friends, never have I heard this thing. No, 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 but uh, no, 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 no. In Montreal, you'll never hear it. And especially with the Bangladeshis, you will never hear it. They will say Nojul is mine and Rabindranath is mine. But, but with, within West Bengal, there is certainly this thing of actually um, uh, separating and uh, distributing and thinking of who is mine and who is not mine. With Nojul, the other politics that happened around Nojul was also re re taking Nojul over and making Nojul into the national poet of Bangladesh was also another kind of politics that happened, a politics of partition that kind of extended beyond partition. I mean, I'm not saying that everybody says this, but this there is this politics around, around um, if you just think of why Nojul, why in Bangladesh they say Nojul Shongit and why in, in West Bengal we say Nojul Giti. If you think about that, what is the difference between Giti and Shongit? Why did they need to say Shongit? Because they wanted to claim a higher place for Nojul's songs. And therefore they said they did not, Giti seems to be, this is the kind of hierarchy that we have within language. And so they wanted to place a higher value, give a higher value to Nojul Ergan, and therefore they said Nojul Shungit. These kinds of, this kind of political game is there. But this exhibition tried to go beyond that. And so we also brought in people who were not, not Bengalis. For example, Peter Cusack, about whom I was talking yesterday, Peter, who has recorded a sound artist who has recorded in East London, and he has a project called Favorite Sounds Project. So he records a place and its sounds, and he goes around asking people, what is the, your favorite sound of this place? And that's how he maps a place. So uh, Peter's mapping of East London, we brought in, you know. We brought in people like uh, uh, Kalidash Gupto, we, we brought in people like Debin Bhattacharjo, the field recordist who'd worked in, from Paris and in, uh, in, um, in London, who lived in London and recorded for the BBC. So all kinds of people from the past, from the archives, as well as people across, so all kinds of bands, Cure the band, you know, who work with a lot of British musicians, and you had uh, someone from Bharati Obidda Bhavon coming and singing. So you had a range, you had Sushila Raman, who, uh, who uh, is ni neither Bengali nor, uh, um, he is not Bengali, but who sings, sometimes sings Baul Gan. So we had her sing uh, uh, Shama Shongit. So all kinds of people uh, became part of this project in, um, in London in the UK and this became a much bigger project and so and it included a lot more voices and a lot more diversity that is there uh, within the UK. Yes, I see a hand up but maybe we have another session. Yeah. We'll now go out for tea and all the questions we can ask for. <laughs> and uh, so, but I think we cannot stick to schedule. So we'll meet uh, in 20 minutes at uh, 5.50. Let's try to speak. Thank you.